My daughter, she spent uh, January, she's a senior at St. Olaf College. She spent uh, January in Italy and France. She went by herself for a couple of weeks and her only response was, hey dad, do you know how easy it was to get around? I knew exactly how to get around on trains. I knew how to get around the buses. I knew how to get the bike shares. It was, it was, it was just like all of this stuff that you, you know, you've been working with me. It was, just came so natural. I'm sure for you and your wife, that was like a proud parenting moment. Oh, I, I wanted to tape that and put it on the refrigerator and you know, that could take all the other places where it said, dad, you're right. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Town Channel. I'm John Simmerman, and that is Travis Norville, who many of you know as the peddling pastor out on Twitter. Uh, we're gonna be talking about his book, uh, The Church on the Move, and some other good things, including parking reform and churches and getting around by walking, biking, and transit. Uh, it's a good one, so I'm gonna get right to it with Travis. Enjoy. Travis, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. Welcome. Thank you, John. It's great to be here. Yeah, great to be here. So, Travis, I love to have folks that just kind of uh, share a little bit about themselves. So who is Travis? Yeah, Travis, uh, I'm a American Baptist pastor in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I call myself the peddling pastor. And about 10 years ago, I gave up my car for my job as a pastor and started walking, biking, and taking public transit. And that's kind of how I've made my, well, I guess that's how you know me, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I think you're right, yeah. yeah. Um, and in fact, I, it's, it has to be Twitter. It has to be yeah, it Twitter. Is Twitter. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 So you are the peddling pastor out on, on Twitter. And what are you doing hanging out on Twitter like this? <laughs> Well, you know, it really wasn't like planned to that way, you know, I, I, uh, it's been kind of a fun thing. So, you know, yeah. the, the, as long as we have Twitter, right? Uh, yeah. Um, as long as it's around, you know, might yeah. as well use it. <laughs> it's been a great way to meet other people in, uh, you know, in the mobility and transit and biking, walking circles. I don't think I would have been exposed to probably two thirds of the people that I follow unless it had been for Twitter. So for me, it's been a great resource and a yeah. way to connect with people. Yeah. 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 It's, it, it's, it's been, I know I've had this conversation a couple of times in the last few months because we just don't know. We don't know what the livelihood of that platform is going to be, but it's been pretty special in terms of the things that we have been able to, well, I don't want to say the things that we've been able to accomplish, but I mean, the connections that, that have been made out uh, on Twitter, hashtag you know, bike Twitter, you know, the, and, and the urbanism. And it's not just bikes. I mean, it's, it literally is not just bikes. It, it, it is about, about livable places and urbanism and livable communities and, uh, and bikes are just cool and functional and practical and pragmatic and, you know, and all those good things. But why don't you share a little bit about your story as to how you came to being the pedaling pastor and your, your love of bikes. Yeah, so I, I, I take the uh, story all the way back to childhood. I, I grew up in the country in West Virginia. We lived on a dirt road. And, you know, I loved going to town, even though it was a town of like 10,000, small town. I loved going down and watching the bus. One of my neighbors would, would take the bus to work every day, and I would have to pass him as I was going to grade school. And I would watch him, and I thought, wouldn't it really great to take the bus? I loved to walk home from school. I had a two mile walk and, and I loved just walking home from school and I loved riding my bike and I loved just being able to get down to town and ride around. I think for me, the really big opening part was when I was in sixth grade, we had uh, crossing guards, patrols. We had a sixth grade trip. And if you were a, a good enough patrol for the whole year, you got to go to Washington, D.C. And I went to Washington, D.C. with sixth grade. And I remember we're coming into town, coming into D.C. proper. And I look out this, the window of the Greyhound bus and there was a separated bike lane. And I had never seen anything like that in my life. And I thought this is the coolest thing ever. Uh, and so I came home and my parents are like, you know, tell us about the you know, Washington Memorial. Tell us about going to the Capitol. And all I wanted to talk about was this bike lane uh, that they had. And there were people riding bikes around town. It just looked like an amazing thing. And they just kind of rolled their eyes at that. And, you know, fast forward over the years, you know, I, in seminary, I... I didn't have a car for a while, and so I was riding a bike to school, you know, and then, I don't know, I just wanted to try that as an ideal, and every time I tried it as a pastor working, it just didn't work out. You know, the first time I tried it, 
I walked to somebody's house for a visit and the guy looked at me and said, preacher, don't we pay you enough to buy, you know, to drive a car? And I thought to myself, you, actually, you don't. But uh, <laughs> as, as a matter of fact, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I didn't want to go there. Uh, you know, and, and it, I, I tried riding my bike and somebody threw a it was a college town and the college students threw beer bottles at me as I was riding my bike. So it wasn't a, all a pleasant experience. I tried it again in Rhode Island when I was working and it was just a really, you know, the new, narrow New England roads that didn't have bike infrastructure. It was really difficult. But that's where I heard my first story of somebody. It's the first funeral I did there. Uh, they talked about this guy who was a professor at RISD and he rode his bike year round. And everyone kind of rolled their eyes and it was kind of a chuckle at his idiosyncrasy. But I was like, wow, somebody can ride their bike year round. I got to try that. Uh, it still didn't work. Uh, I tried it in New Orleans. I thought this is a perfect city, right? It's compact. It's flat. I didn't take into account how much, how hot it was. And I didn't take into account that every day at 4 p.m., you know, 3 or 4 o'clock, you know, it rained. So I would always show up at people's house or at the hospital or wherever, you know, just drenched. Uh, either in sweat or in, with rain. And people would say, you know, can I get you a shirt or here, sit by the fan? It just created a weird boundary issue that I wasn't really comfortable with. And and then finally, so we moved to Minneapolis and uh, I had this car and I loved the car. It was a Volkswagen. I loved the way the sound, the door closed. I loved all the engineering parts of it, the heated seats, everything. But it just was costing me an arm and a leg to maintain. And so finally the heater went out and I just looked and, to my, uh, my wife and said, I can't do it anymore. And she said, okay. And then that, uh, that was like on a Saturday. On Sunday, I preached a sermon, which I thought was just your, your basic kind of Christian socialism sermon. And I asked a question, you know, what are you willing to give up so that others may experience joy? And my daughter, who was 11 at the time, you know, I went to tell her goodnight and she said, hey, dad, what are you willing to do so that others may experience joy? And when she said that, I just felt like a complete phony. I don't know why. I just felt my mouth went ash and I said, I don't know but I'll have an answer for you in the morning. And so that night I turned our dining room table into a makeshift midlife crisis center, I had all these notebooks and my laptop and I figured it out. I was like, okay. So the next morning I said, I got it guys. Uh, I'm going to, we're going to sell the car. I'm going to bike and walk and take public transit uh, for my job. And their, their reaction was just abject horror. Uh, <laughs> and he lost his mind. Yes, exactly. I mean, it was January. It was during a polar vortex here in Minneapolis. Uh, and I said, look, this is my thing, not yours. And so they breathed a sigh of relief. And then that, you know, that, that's the start of the journey. That's how it yeah. just became who I am now. Well, and, there, and, and there's a long history, of course. I mean, if we go back to the beginning of time, I mean. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, some say that this is the, the, you know, the, the, the idea of a, of a bicycle, you know, from the wheels of, in a, a Book of Ezekiel, this image that the prophet has, and then here's a in St. Giles, this uh, image of it in the in the uh, stained glass. But I mean, obviously, this is not the forerunner of a bicycle, but it, it really makes me think that it is. And Carlton Reed would, as soon as I put that on Twitter, Carlton emailed me, "That's not a bicycle." So yeah, yeah, yeah. that true, Car Carlton, yeah, yeah. and 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 Carlton is one of uh, you know the, the the wonderful authors and, and writers that is out there. He's both an author of books as well as a journalist, uh, and uh, he pr produces some wonderful stuff. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there's there's some history of you know people in the clergy riding bikes. Yeah, and, and here's a you know a clergyman that was in uh, Edgefield, England, and after he died, the congregation honored him with this stained glass window uh, with him on a bike just because of all the peddling that he did. And you know, I just find these people to be you know re great role models, and yeah, we should be doing this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, and and what's what's kind of interesting too about your journey, and by the way, you you do a beautiful job uh, talking about your journey and 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 really. Um, explaining it in a very approachable way in your book. Um, so why don't you share just briefly about why you felt motivated to, to, to write the book? Because I think that that's, that's a big part of, of this overall journey for you, because it wasn't just about, oh, okay, you know, I don't want to, I can't afford, or I don't want to afford to, to fix this car. You want to do this because it profoundly changed your life become, you know, really leaning into active mobility. Talk a little bit more about that. Yeah. I mean, that was never the, that was never the goal, right? It began as a 
personal journey. And right. then the more that I started riding my bike and walking and taking a bus, I became exposed to all kinds of, of people and communities that I had no idea about. I, you know, I went to a, what's what we call like a social gospel, you know, a liberal Protestant divinity school. And we talk a lot about social justice, economic justice, you know, being with the poor. But if I did a audit of my life, I realized I was hardly spending any time, you know, sharing space with the poor or talking about some of the issues that I really cared about. Or I was just talking about them, but I didn't have like stories about it or, you know, direct experiences. And the more I started riding my bike and taking the bus and being with people, well, then that just opened the floodgates really for to realize about the economics of mobility and transit to think about the way that our towns and cities are uh, segregated purposely through uh, design and through you know, housing contracts and codes and all this, uh, all this kind of stuff. And it just made me realize that how come some parts of the city have really nice sidewalks, other parts have really bad sidewalks? How is it that some ways that these interstate systems have not only segregated but divided us as communities? Uh, that, that was you know, A lot of that stuff started coming in. And then the more of it, I started thinking of walking, biking, and taking public transit as, as really as metaphors uh, for ways for people to get into the community. And, you know, a lot of times churches are, you know, they're these wonderful old buildings. You know, a lot of them are modeled after English castles. And I had a friend say, you know, if the French decide to invade, you know, we're ready for them. I don't think that's really the fortress mentality that we want to have. We want to be in the community and around people and I think that the best way for churches to do that is to get out in your community by walking, riding your bike, and taking public transit. You're going to get to know people. You're going to get to know your community better. And, and people are going to get to know you. And you're going to actually know what you should be talking about uh, from the stories that you hear and the people that you engage with. So that's where the book kind of came from. How, yeah. It's a recipe book. Um, and what's, what's interesting, though, too, is – you touch upon many different themes in, in this book that are that are uh, themes that I keep bringing up and, and my guests keep bringing up uh, here on the Active Towns podcast uh, time and time again. And you just mentioned it there uh, briefly in terms of like one of them was just like the sociability, the, the social cohesiveness and connectedness. Talk a little bit more about that and how, you know, making that shift to active mobility has really – uh, sort of opened your eyes to the potential of of that for, from your perspective? Yeah. I think about just some of sometimes on the bus rides that I take. Uh, when, I'm, when I'm on the bus, I, I, I view buses, bus rides as, I don't know, between a 15 and a 30 minute uh, community that's voluntarily gathered together. You know, there's just different people that you meet on the bus that you can't meet in your car. In car, and look, we still own a van. I'm not anti-car, even though I have a war on cars mug usually around me. Uh, you know, but but a car, in some ways, traps you. It's an exoskeleton that prevents you from engaging with the other person. And when you're on a bus or walking or even on a bike, you have to engage with the other people, even if it's just an eye contact, or maybe for some people, it's just a smell or just a engagement, acknowledgement of their humanity. You have to have that little engagement, and I think it really creates some of the most beautiful stories of, of human transformation. Uh, there's been times when you know you've watched people you've watched people whose anger escalates on the bus, and all it really takes is for one other person to maybe put their hand on their shoulder, or maybe just a hey, you know, sh share my cup of coffee. I mean, I saw somebody one time have a loaf of banana bread. They pulled out of their backpack and said, "Hey, are you hungry?" I mean, those things can't happen in a car. Uh, and I think they, they really kind of transform us when we're uh, participating in active mobility uh, in that regard. Yeah. It's funny that you mentioned, uh, you know, a war on cars, because, you know, sometimes I think the, 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 the cars are having a war on, on the churches. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. This, is, <laughs> this is the uh, Lake Avenue Memorial Baptist Church in Rochester, New York. It's where I was ordained. And a couple weeks ago, I get this text from the pastor and saying that, you know, the, the church was hit by a car. And I was like, wow, what, what kind of, I mean, I know it's not, I, I don't think that you know, the divine works in that way, but I did think, wow, how, how crazy is this that the church that, you know, I was ordained, I was hit by a car and it's, and it's not in an area that um, it's kind of in like a, a V shaped section of town with, it's got plenty of trees and grass between. I mean, the car really had to go out of its way to run into that side of the church. So 
Yeah, it does feel like the yeah yeah. The, and hey, where, there, like where there's a will, there's a way. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. I'm not saying they're evil. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But how many times have we seen like you know on a separated bike lane, you know, on a bridge or somewhere like here's a car right in the middle? Like, what are you thinking? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so I'm trying to like I I'm I'm trying to conjure up this image of of you. Um, you know, riding around the community, you know, connected, uh, you know, to the community and waving to people and, and greeting folks. And so I'm trying to conjure up the, the image of, of what it mu- must be like with you, uh, with your bike out there. And, and of course, the image that kind of pops into my head is, is that you know, it must be something like this, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's the Sydney Chambers. Some of you may know from Grant Chester, the PBS mystery. Yeah, this is what we all think we look like, right? This you yeah. know, handsome beautiful person riding this, you know, great, you know, vintage British bike, but you know, that's really not who Dapper, I tell you. Yes. Oh, yeah, or, that, like or, or this, yeah. you know, dignified. Or, yeah, yeah. Archbishop Tutu. I mean, yeah. he's got a great story about a bike in his uh, childhood, but it was a bike that really kind of helped him kind of cross boundaries. And it was given to him by a, a white minister. And, and that was the thing that he's always talked about, just how much joy that bike brought him. And, you know, John, I'll say this about your podcast, you know, and, especially is that, you know, when you listen to the show, you know, how much joy you have, right? I mean, you're smiling a lot in it. You're not sitting there frowning and I mean, you could be, uh, but I think that's kind of the positivity part that, uh, sometimes that I am frowning. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> like, where is this going? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I got a bone to pick with you because, you know, um, parking is like a huge, huge thing. Um, you know, in our urban setting and, uh, and and the situations that are out there, and and I saw I somebody gave me this this photo and it, it's a picture of privilege that that, that happens here. Yeah. What's going on here? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So one time uh, I went away for summer break. You know, I mean, just for a couple of weeks for vacation, and the church installed some bike parking. And we have you know here in Minneapolis, there's a great uh, deal with, you know, Darrow bike, uh, stuff where they will pay for half of this. You know, if you pay for half, they'll pay for the other half, uh, with the city. So they did this and then somebody went out and bought like, you know, this is for a car. They don't make them small enough for a, for a bike, but it takes up a lot of space. But yeah, this is my own private parking spot, uh, that the church has. And we have a preschool here and sometimes the preschool kids will park there and I will tell them like, look, you can park there kid, but you know, you got to preach on Sunday. And they usually get this, you know, <laughs> terrified look and then they quickly move their bike. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I can't believe that. Uh, yeah. yeah. So for, for the listening audience, what we're looking at here is uh, Travis's bike uh, parked at a bike rack uh, with a sign re- reserved for clergy. Yeah. Yeah. I, I tell you that that privilege. I, I you know, I guess back to your, your point, it's, it's not like you're raking in millions of dollars, you know, doing this sort of work, you know, so you might as well have a perk one or two. But but let's get serious. Let's let's talk a little bit about churches and parking and you wrote an article about it yeah this this was a this is an adaptation of one of the chapters and this is the thing that i did not expect to get the most uh, uh, i don't know most energy from so people now refer to me as, hey you're the church parking lot dude and i'm yeah i guess i am now i'll i'll, I'll take that but this is uh, appeared in christian century and lo and behold it ended up being the fifth most read article of 2022 was on church parking lots. So that just shows me that there are a lot of people thinking about church parking lots other than just the temporary storage of automobiles. Now, I live here, you know, Minneapolis is Lutherland, so there are Lutherans everywhere. You can't throw a rock without hitting them. Uh, and there are giant Lutheran churches. And I like to ride my bike by and just take pictures of their parking lots at different times. And what you'll find is, even on the Sunday morning, or even like the largest funeral they have, the parking lots are only full maybe 5% of the time. And my thought, okay, what if churches started thinking different about their parking lots other than just car storage? Uh, And some of the things I ask for people to think about is, you know, put a basketball court on it. Put a bike, you know, kind of bike route on it and uh, put some just put some circles for kids to ride around to kind of learn about. You can plant food. I mean, you can have these straw bale gardening, which started here in Minnesota as a great way. And, And in the space of two parking spots, you can grow enough food to feed, you know, uh, two families of four. So uh, just think about that. And also people don't realize that church parking lots throughout America live in this odd zone 
uh, and by that I mean both literal and, and metaphorical. But if the zoning laws that a lot of zoning laws that would apply to the lot directly next to the parking lot do not apply to the church parking lot. Uh, and so what you're finding is a lot of churches throughout America, I mean, a lot, not a lot, not enough. I wish there were more, are starting to put tiny homes in their church parking lots. And you can put two or three tiny homes, take up two or three spaces, use some of the church's community space for, you know, cooking and just gathering for the people in these tiny homes. And you can really revolutionize, I think, a lot of American society by thinking of the church parking lot as more than just a place to store your car while you go to worship. Yeah. And for, again, the listening uh, uh, audience, the visual that we have up on screen here is you know, sort of your, your typical parking lot. It actually does have some uh, green strips in it um, so that there is actually some water, you know, filtration, storm water filtration that could happen in this area. And I, and I do spy at least one tree uh, planted in there, but it does kind of, you know, make the, it, you know, it pops out, you know, for me of saying, oh, wow, you know, it, you could you could totally change this from what looks like just kind of weeds or wild stuff growing. You could probably, you know, actually do a little garden along these these strips quite easily um, versus the, the 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 Baptist church uh, two blocks away from me here in in Austin, Texas. Uh, this is an overhead view. We're looking you know, from the satellite view down. And we can see they have not one, but two parking lots, a, a small one uh, where this is the street view of, of the small one here at this Baptist, uh, you know, parking lot or, or Baptist church. And, uh, and then we kind of scroll over to the large one here. Come on, come back here. There we go. That's what I wanted. Um, and we can kind of, you know, get, get the visual there. And we see that, to your point, yeah, it's a tremendous amount of wasted space. And one of the things that you pointed out in the book, too, was that there's this pressure, you know, for especially small churches in urban areas, churches that may have been actually established like many other, you know, social institutions. I mean, we, we happen to be talking about churches, but we could be talking about other other groups and gathering places, whether they be, you know, fraternal organizations or whatever. Part of that, you know, that the third place or whatever. It's like in places that's not work and not home. It's something else. It's community and those institutions. But there's like this pressure to try to accommodate the automobile and try to accommodate potential patrons and, and guests and people arriving to that establishment, whether it's a business or a church or, or organization by car so much so that they may even like tear down housing next to them to create a parking lot. And then you just mentioned trying to think of ways of how do we turn that back into housing? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And my, and my thought is that if a church, uh, this is something I've been saying kind of since the book, you know, talking about churches, churches probably, yeah, it could be a school, it could be a library, we go down the line of, of social institutions. If you're going to tear down a house to put parking on it, then you have to do, I think, everything possible to redeem that act. You know, that this place better be life producing, not just, you know, sucking the life out of the community. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's extraordinary. The, the other thing, and, and you do reference, by the way, um, Don Shoup's uh, wonderful book, The High Cost of Free Parking in here. And so you you clearly were drinking from the fire hose of urbanism. Uh, you, you I think you referenced Chuck Marone uh, in there with Strong Towns. You've been on his podcast in the past. And, and so clearly you were boning up on a lot of these, you know, urbanism topics. You know, what was that like? Kind of like, getting inundated with, you know, a whole new world of thought just because you decided to not fix that car. Yeah. It's been <laughs> very surprising. I, sometimes I feel like I should have got an extra degree, you know, the, the, just from the reading that I've done. Uh, it's been fantastic. You know, uh, the, the, and here's been the kind of the fun part about the reception of the book so far. It's been a year, uh, March 15th. So I have had a lot of interest uh, from kind of urbanism, kind of civic planners. Those people have been very interested in the book. I think they have more faith in kind of faith communities than faith communities have in themselves. 
I haven't got as much interest from church communities. Uh, that's starting to pick up, but been very slow. But it's just been great to kind of read these things and, and find new ideas. And it, I didn't expect to go down this road. It just kind of happened. Once you start, yeah, once that fire hose gets turned on, it's hard to say no. Uh, you just start seeing things in different ways. And I started realizing how social policy, you know, kind of really it was influencing faith communities. It was beyond our control. You know, we think about those churches that want to have a parking lot. You know, they were right in the middle of what you could say are 15 minute neighborhoods. You know, they were all 15 minute neighborhood churches. Uh, and then, uh, you know, we have the highway bill and we have the you know, kind of GI bill for homes. And, you know, things just things drastically change. And all of a sudden, you know, if a church that was surrounded by its neighborhood and was really a neighbor to its to its uh, community, all of a sudden became neighborless because all the members moved, you know, 20 minutes by car rather than 15 minutes by a walk. And it just drastically changed who we were. Uh, and you saw this great rise. It worked for a little bit. I mean, the 1950s were great for faith communities in America. And now we're all we're all kind of barely hanging on, uh, it feels like. And I think a lot of that has to do with being neighborless or yeah, unneighboring churches. Yeah, yeah. And you mentioned, the, you know, policy there. I'm going to, you know, head over to this image here. This is probably not an image you recognize. This is uh, from up in Ontario, Canada. And uh, it's a typical scene of where the policy, the public policy that is is currently in place in front of this church is such that uh, they can actually park in that is actually a bike lane. That's a marked bike bike lane. And uh, as you can see, there's cars lined up parked in the bike lane. And um, and basically there's a provision that allows church parking to park in the bike lane uh, in this community. You'll, you'll see to the right of this image, they have a parking lot Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> around the corner, around the corner, there is a municipal parking lot. So there's even off street parking around the corner. And yet there was this need that, you know, pressure from the church to the city to preserve, you know, on street parking. And thus, you know, my friend who, 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 uh, uh, you know, snap this shot and his daughter, you know, they have to, when they're riding their bike, they have to merge over and control the lane. And you can see a very large truck, you know, coming towards us and on screen here. And so, it, and trucks are getting larger. SUVs are getting <laughs> yeah. larger in this, this uh, society. It, it's a scary thing. I mean, this is really, really interesting, you know, how pervasive, you know, kind of this, this orientation car brain is, and it, it starts bleeding into public policy, starts bleeding into, you know, churches trying to survive because I, I guarantee you that, you know, their communication is like, look, you know, our parishioners are getting older. We, you know, they can't walk as far. I mean, there's some legitimate concerns here. How do we balance this out from your perspective? Yeah, I mean, I think about this a lot and I get, you know, I get questioned on this a lot. People, yeah. Uh, snap pictures of those churches, you know, throughout the nation. And say, hey, what do you think about this? You know, I, I think there's two things. One is that, yeah, I mean, there are some legitimate concerns of people that are, you know, elderly, not as mobile as they'd like to be. You know, yeah, we got to preserve spaces for those. And generally, in most public institutions, there are spaces that we can accommodate for those. But it's people that maybe that should, I mean, they, they could walk or they could take the bus or carpool with someone else or ride their bike. I mean, there's, there's other ways around it uh, for that. And sometimes I, ch I challenge people this. I was like, when you went to the airport, how far did you walk from your car to the front gate? Um, or how many of you have been to on vacation to Mackinac Island? Um, or, I mean, or Well, you just, you just can't, you know, just drop that in there without explaining it. Yeah. 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 You know, Mackinac Island's is beautiful place in, uh, in Lake Michigan and there doesn't allow cars. You know, the only vehicles, I guess what Mike Pence did get a car when he went there a couple years ago, but Sacrilege. everybody else. So yeah. yes, this, the story is, and I don't think it's Lake Michigan. I think it's, uh, actually oh, no, yeah, Lake yeah, Huron. Yeah. Lake Huron. It's in right? Michigan yeah. up towards the, 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 the upper peninsula there. And, uh, yeah, since the 1800s, it has been a, a, a motor vehicle free zone. There's, I think, two or three 
technically two or three motor vehicles that are on in, in place there, and they're all emergency services uh, vehicles, or, or the coroner has a vehicle. But other than that, it's uh, people power or horsepower. And people love it. People spend, if you priced what a hotel room there cost, <laughs> I mean, people pay an exorbitant amount of money to go there and not drive their car. So if we can do that, it's just trying to think, and this is why I'm so big on why I wrote the book a lot, is that if faith communities can get involved in this work, we've got a huge amount of leverage that we can apply to social policy. And, you know, people just assume that churches don't want to be involved in this, but you know, I'm finding the churches do want to be involved in this. Uh, they do want to be involved in, you know, how their cities looks and runs and the health of people. And, you know, I find it, again, this was the idea. If I can get people out of their church buildings or, or their faith communities, you know, when you when you fear that you're about to, you know, that, that life is just, you know, you're gripping by, you know, finger your fingertips, you know, you think that the, you have to kind of close your mind and have everything kind of inward focus. But really, you know, the, the idea is really if you turn it outward, and, and, and become part of the community, you're going to have a much better chance of making it. And so that's why, I, that's part of the reason I'm trying to write the book. Yeah, or I wrote the book. So the book uh, title is uh, a Church on the Move, A Practical Guide uh, for Ministry in the Community. Uh, is is this your, your your future church right here? Yeah, this, <laughs> I would, I would be really fun. This is, uh, this is a, a restored chapel car. Uh, so there was a time when, you know, we're thinking about going to, America moving westward, that churches had one car, a, a train car that they made into these chapels, and they would just go around to around the west, uh, in the Midwest. And I, I think it's a great idea. Uh, I think, this is, again, it's part of this, this is part of our DNA, uh, faith communities, that we were trying to do these kind of things all along uh, without cars. We, and I tell people, look, for 1,900 years, you know, the church survived without a car. And for 1,900 years, it survived without a parking lot. You know, we, we've, we've got great history. We can do this. Yeah. 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 I, I, I could totally see you, you know, like, you know, f- figure out a way to, to work with the city and get a, you know, street, a streetcar line and you've got your movable uh, church right there. Boom. Yeah. You know, when I lived in New Orleans, there was an old tradition that the priests and nuns did not have to pay to ride the streetcar. Yeah. And there were still enough kind of old streetcar drivers that on Sunday mornings, they would never, they wouldn't let me pay. They would just say, come on, you know, hop on. So, <laughs> yeah. Oh man, that's, that's interesting. Uh, so, so talk a little bit more about how churches and, and when I say churches, folks, I, I, I don't literally mean churches, but I mean other institutions similar to, to churches that we can think of in our communities and, and societies can be be more welcoming uh, to 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 people arriving on bikes and getting people to to use bikes uh, uh, more frequently. And I'll pull up uh, Dave Walker's illustration here, uh, which which helps to to sort of illustrate uh, what we're talking about in terms of ways that your church or insert institution can welcome people who cycle. Yeah, this was a scheme. I love the I love the British way of thinking of an idea as a scheme. But uh, this is a scheme that the the Diocese of Manchester uh, came up with on trying to incorporate more bicycling into their city. Uh, and so here we just have these ways, right? Bike racks. Uh, just putting bike racks out is a great way to communicate. Uh, or the fix it stations uh, to have those available for for people. Or you know, I really like to think of the parking lot again, having some spaces on you know, just a, a track so kids can learn how to bike. You know, there's a lot of places in urban areas where there's, there aren't safe places to learn how to ride. So here's a, a place. And if you read, you know, about the early history of bikes in Amsterdam, a lot of church basements were bike schools where where people learned how to ride bikes. I think we've got a, a, a part there to do that. Um, I think it's also kind of a mind shift on what we wear. So it's OK to ri- arrive someplace, maybe a little out of breath and maybe a little sweaty. Uh, and it's okay if you have if you're more at, leaning towards athleisure than towards you know business suits. Being people, people welcome them to that. I think there's just a lot of things that we can do to make uh, biking more uh, accessible and also welcoming. You know, water, just having water bottle. I mean, not water bottles, but you know, having a um, the kind of water fountains where you can fill a water bottle up. Or I like to tell. I, the biggest part I do is just try to tell stories. Hey, this is who I met on a bike this week. 
This is who I met on the sidewalk. This is who I met on the bus. Just ways that if you just tell those stories, I think you have a better shot at incorporating all this. You know, there was a last year, there was a League of American Cyclists had their annual meeting. And I was on a panel with a, a, a gentleman who, from North Carolina who talked about libraries and bicycles. And his biggest spot was if you can start a bike ride at a library as opposed to a bike shop you're going to have a more diverse and more inclusive community. So I think of you know, faith communities, uh, so all these social institutions as being places that can just start. That's where you start the bike ride. I think it just shifts the way that people are thinking about who may be there and who may be participating in the ride. It also sort of, you know, reminds me too of, you know, every year we have our national uh, bike to work day or bike, bike to school day. And, and I think that's important to remember, too, that we have to support others in being able to accomplish something because it's so ingrained in us that we get in a car to make that trip. And so it may not be there, there's a little bit of a learning curve to understanding that, oh, by the way, if we're going to the grocery store, we can actually make that trip by bike. But I'm not sure. How do I do that. And so the how to is, is a very, very important thing to have is yes, we need the modeling, mm-hmm. you know, in this illustration, it, there's a, a, a section there or, there, or a, a, a illustration there that says, you know, cycling to the church and an arrow pointing to the clergyman, you know, <laughs> giving the sermon. It's like, yeah, you're modeling that behavior. You're, you're showing leadership by doing that. But then that next step is also how do you help provide support and scaffolding, uh, as as my friend Sam Balto uh, with the bike uh, bus uh, talks about, to, to help people say, oh, and by the way, we're, we're going to help you with this. We're going to show you how to do this, you, you know, all, all the way down to, yeah, you don't have to wear fancy clothes, you know, for doing this. You know, you can wear your normal clothes and we're not going to be moving fast, so we're not going to be getting sweaty and all of these different things. As, as well as just to the point of, you know, maybe the bike isn't even in, in good repair. And so making sure that the equipment is safe. So there's a lot of, um, I don't want to call it handholding, but you know what I mean? It's, there's a lot of support that may need to be provided to be able to get the momentum of habit formation going, because I'm sure even for you, when you made that move, there was a lot of learning that was going on in terms of suddenly yeah, I'm, I'm riding my bike. I'm, I don't have that car anymore to fall back on. I'm walking, I'm riding my bike. I'm p- taking transit. There's a learning curve there. There's a huge learning curve. And I think that these kind of social institutions are the prime places in our society to help people and teach them how to do this. You know, one of the things we do here is just, we're going to take the bus downtown to a twins game just to teach people how you get on the bus and how it works. Yeah, it I mean, could be scary the, to, to people who oh, haven't yeah. done it. Yeah. Maybe they, they've only heard of other people having negative experiences with it, or maybe they've attempted it and they're like, I can't make heads or tails of this map in, in, yeah. in route. So yeah, it's a good, that's a good point. Yeah. I mean, I think about, yeah. I mean, when I first was learning all this, you know, I couldn't figure out the numbering system for buses, you know, in between the number four and the number five is the number 18 line and they're all running North, South. And you know, I couldn't figure that out. And I still can't figure it out. Um, <laughs> uh, there's those kind of things. And you know, I think some uh, evil genius is back there just yeah. laughing and going, I'm going to mess with these guys. <laughs> I'm sure there are historic reasons, you know. Yeah. Um, but, you know, like, so this, this kind of, it's, it's an interesting point, though. And so I'm working on the next book. And, and I realized that after a year of kind of talking with people, I really needed to write a prequel to this book, kind of getting people, because like, all the questions I got from churches were, really basic ideas. Like there was one organization of a group of pastors in New Jersey and they wanted to know how to, how to join a group bike ride. And I'm like, you know, I'm in Minnesota, you're in New Jersey. Like, I don't know where the group bike rides are, but just, but maybe the one way would be just, just to go sit at a coffee shop. When you see the bike ride group go by, try to, you know, flag somebody down. And, but I realized there's a lot of those basic things. How do you, how do you ride? What is the route like? What's, what conditions am I biking in? All this kind of thing should be those uh, kind of foundational things are really the kind of bread and butter that I think like faith communities could, could really be uh, of service. Yeah. 
Now, I always get the, the question, you know, from individuals who are watching the, the videos on the Active Towns channel or listening to the podcast. They say, well, I, I've been I'm inspired by the conversations you all are having. What can I do as an individual in my community to to head in a more positive direction when it comes to this, this sort of stuff of active mobility? Yeah, when, when people ask me that, you know, I, I just say, can you lean in with curiosity? You know, can you just ask, ask your community, hey, I want to do this. Can anybody help me? And you'd be surprised at how many people there, maybe that also are in the same boat as you. And you'll be surprised that there's probably somebody in the community that also would want to help you, uh, to help you get through that uh, part. You know, when I first started, yeah, I, I was amazed at the number of people that came up and said, hey, I used to ride my bike in the winter. Uh, when I was working, here's what I did. Or people would say uh, they would come and you know give me an old pair of gloves that you know they were they were worn out. I appreciate the gesture, but it would at least give you a little bit of that you know, start off with curiosity, and then I, I go back to realize you're going to make a ton of mistakes, and just have just lean into the mistakes. It's going to happen. It's going to be okay, and, and you'll learn um, a lot of fr- a lot from them. But yeah, I guess for me it's just the leaning with curiosity. I think that's the best way you can do, and you're you're going to have probably be a better chance at success that way. I like that too, you know, leaning in with curiosity and you talk about this in the book is like you, when you slow down, take the time to, you know, walk, you know, take the time to get on a bike. You're not, you're not concerned with getting there fast. It's not the fastest way you're choosing intentionally the slower way. And so when you walk out into your neighborhood and you, you are suddenly able to really embrace that curiosity and embrace the uh, connectedness that you can have with others in your community that you, you come in contact with. So I think that's a beautiful part of, you know, it also helps you get to know who your neighbors are and who your community is. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it's it's slower, but it's faster, you know, in a, in a paradoxical way, because you, I mean, there's a house that I walk by that I know every Tuesday they're cooking Italian food and I just want to walk right by and I want to knock on the door and find out about them. It's slower, but also just the intentional part of the, you're, I think you're healthier, maybe not necessarily physically. I mean, you are a little bit, but just mentally healthier, you know, the benefits of walking, being in fresh air, uh, taking a bike. Yeah, it's slower, but the added benefit that you have, the clarity that you have about life. I can't tell you how many times I've had a terrible time, uh, had, a, had a bad meeting or an argument with somebody, and I get on a bike or I, or I walk, and by the time I get home, you know, I'm calmer, I feel better, and I'm, I'm probably in a better place to call the person up and say, you know, I'm sorry, I was, I was a jerk back there. Or we really kind of saw this in the wrong place. It's just a – that's slower but faster. I love that too. And that's great. Uh, and it reminds me of the speed of trust because you can only go as fast. You can only move as quickly, you know, in any of these, uh, difficult, uh, transform transformative, uh, things that we're trying to do within our communities. You can only go as fast as there's trust in the community. And so the speed of trust is, is such that, yeah, mm-hmm. until we really know each other and can trust each other, you can't really move forward with a lot of these, uh, ideas and changes like, Limiting the amount of parking at, at the church. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the speed of trust. I love that. Thanks. Yeah. It's, it's actually a, the a book title of, uh, of a book on my, in my library. And uh, honestly, I can't remember now <laughs> how much of it is, is about this, but I'm pretty darn sure it's all about slowing down to make sure you have that connectedness and really know your audience. So a, a photo that you sent along, uh, which I want to pull up here is, is also about the, the, the power of physical activity uh, throughout our, our, our generations. And as we get older, talk a little bit about this. You know, so, so, many, so much of my time is spent in nursing homes, you know, kind of into life care. And when I talk with people, what, what I love to ask people in their 90s, I will ask them a question. Can you remember the first time you rode a bike? And just to watch them close their eyes and get this giant smile on their face. And I'm like, would you like to ride a bike right now? And, I, and all I hear is I would give anything to ride a bike right now. Uh, and and there, are, there are a lot of boomers and there are a lot of you know senior citizens right now that I think that the trike is maybe a, an untapped resource for communities and for, for people with some mobility issues just because you get the stability for it. But I just keep 
asking every time I go to a, a nursing home, like, hey, I show them this picture. I'm like, hey, what do you think about buying a couple of these and just trying them out? You know, just just let me uh, walk with people, you know, to, on, to get them on one of these and just uh, ride around in the in the hallways. Yeah, I'll let, I'll let you I'll let you describe uh, for the listeners what is in this image here. Yeah, this is just an image of a, a, a probably a nursing home or rehab facility. There's an elderly elderly gentleman on a on a trike, and you know you, if you zoom in, it's still really hard, but just has a, a great face. You know, just really enjoying it. And then there is the uh, nurse beside beside them. Um, the nurse is kind of going. I don't know yeah, about this. Yeah. A bike in the hallways here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but. You know, there, uh, my wife and I, we have a contest, and we've had it now for 10 years, I guess. We try to find someone who's riding a bike on, you know, in the, on the parkway with a frown on their face. And we've only had one time, one time out of 10 years, we saw someone, and we're pretty sure that they just had to go to the bathroom. Uh, that was their reason. But, um, but so, I think there so is something about the joy. I, I, I'm glad you brought up the family again because you mentioned them and you channeled them earlier. And you talked a little bit about uh, assuring them that, no, 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 this is this is my thing. I, you know, you, you guys are safe. I'm, I'm not going to coerce you or force you into anything here. But as you mentioned in the book, you know, there was a little bit of a transformation. You were sort of a leader within your own home. And now uh, the family seems to be embracing active mobility a little bit more. Talk a little bit about that transformation that took place within your own household. Yeah, well, there's two things that happened. One was just a normal model of anytime we went somewhere, my thought was, hey, let's ride our bikes or, hey, let's walk. Let's 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 take the bus. And you, know, you got a lot of eye rolls. These are teenagers we're talking about. And I figured out I, I had to figure out that that little pattern of life, you know, from about fifteen to seventeen. If I could somehow adjust their thinking, I went. I, I did an experiment on my kids. I guess I should I should be fully transparent about this. So when the kids turned sixteen, I gave them this option. I said, "Look, you can get your license. That's fine, and we can put you on our insurance. Uh, but realize we have one car, and you know you're going to have to help pay for the insurance to make it work. And you're probably hardly ever going to get to drive it." That's, one, that's option A. You can be postpone getting your license. We will buy you a new bike. We'll fully fund your bus card. And whatever uh, in your allowance will be what it was going to cost us to put you on our insurance. Uh, now, all three kids took the deal. Uh, so all three are still active in this way. And here's the payoff. My daughter, she spent uh, January. She's a senior at St. Olaf College. She spent uh, January in... Italy and France. She went by herself for a couple of weeks and her only response was, hey dad, do you know how easy it was to get around? I knew exactly how to get around on trains. I knew how to get around the buses. I knew how to get the bike shares. It was, it was, it was just like all of this stuff that you, you know, you've been working with me. It was, just came so natural. I'm sure for you and your wife, that was like a proud parenting moment. Oh, I, I wanted to tape that and put it on the refrigerator and, you know, that could take all the other places where it said, Dad, you're right. That's all I wanted was right there. <laughs> I love that you had that impact uh, there in your in your own home. It's uh, what is has been referred to um, up in Winnipeg as like a cultural bomb of oh, bringing, yeah. you know, bikes in. And you channel that uh, story in your um, in your book. And I've I've profiled uh, the activities of the Plain Bright program a couple of times. This is a, the landing page to my second interview with Erin Riediger, uh, who's an architect up there in Winnipeg, and she uh, has the Plain Bicycle uh, podcast. Um, but uh, we were able to to profile sort of that program that existed. You you highlighted it in the book, and it's basically this program where they are taking old abandoned Dutch bikes, piling them into a container and getting them up into Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. And so they call it like this, this, you know, cultural bomb, a bicycle bomb, you know, of, of all of a sudden you have all these easy to ride step through frame upright Dutch bikes. And you just watch sort of that cultural transformation and, and sort of the light bulb moments of people understanding that, oh, you mean riding a bike can be easy and fun and we can get around? Uh, so I, I just had to share that I was delighted and tickled to see that you uh, also uh, channeled the Plain Bicycle program in your book. 
Yeah, and, uh, and I'll just say that back to like the person you said. You know, how can I make change? The like this was my Christmas Eve sermon from a couple of years ago. Was the Plain Bicycle Project? Was you know you look at the percentage. I mean, what what, what I think it's less than uh, half of the percent of people in Winnipeg are are riding these bikes. But the change, the amount of change that they are bringing, it doesn't take a huge amount of people to kind of change society and change culture. It only takes a few to start doing this and you can really uh, build off of that. So I, I love that podcast. I love that story. I think what they're doing in Winnipeg is amazing. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. But Travis, as we bring this to a close, is there anything that we haven't covered that you want to make sure that we leave the audience with? Maybe maybe even some sage advice. Oh, well, you know, I think just one thing, I, I do want to point out my patron saint, uh, you know, Mr. Rogers. You see a picture of him behind me. You know, I would really ask uh, people just to think about Mr. Rogers when you're thinking about public transit and how you can make a difference. I mean, he lean, he leans in with curiosity. He's you know has this compassion. He has this joy of life. This there's a picture right now of a stole that that he wore when he would preach. You know, he was an ordained Presbyterian minister, and, the, and on the stole are his you know his walking shoes. Picture of the trolley car. The people from the uh, land of make believe. I mean, just a a wonderful kind of image to have. And, and I would just ask people to, to take his example and really have it be a, a working example for themselves. You can bring change and you can do it with joy and you can do it with compassion and you can really, you can really change somebody's heart uh, with that model. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Travis, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. This has been an absolute joy. Oh, John, this is fantastic. I can't tell you how thankful I am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with the Pedaling Pastor. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up, leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on that subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell. And if you are enjoying this content, please consider supporting me on Patreon. Buy me a coffee or uh, buying some fun items from the Active Town store. The link is down below in the video description and in the show notes and any support you're able to provide is a huge help and much appreciated. Thank you all so much once again. And until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much. <laughs>